Final seconds of the game. A chance to score and the chance has gone begging. If your business's commerce platform keeps missing the target on golden opportunities, get the MVP you deserve. Get Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool that you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed football boots from Shopify's in-person POS system, or you're vending vintage shirts on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ranks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com forward slash ranks to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash ranks. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Rank Squad and welcome to Ranks FC. It's your favourite football podcast back for another week and back talking about something a little bit different. We're talking about some rule changes that we want to see in football today. Something that's obviously been a hot topic for a little while. We're going to have a little look through and see what we'd like changed in the beautiful game to try and restore it perhaps to its former glory. My name is Jack Collins and I'll be your host today. Joining me, my co-host, Mr. Dean Jones. How you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. Yeah, um, I think people will like this um, episode that we're doing today. It's a little bit different um, because it's a little bit more hypothetical and uh, a bit more uh, unlikely to happen uh, than people might have a more stringent idea of who they think the best winger in the world is or whatever else. But when it comes to rules that we'd like to see, um, we don't really get a say on whether that happens or not or what the actual ranking is going to be but I've got some really good ideas so I'm going to go through them in a bit and I'm going you don't know what they are yet and I'm going to throw them onto you and then at the end we'll rank the best five ideas that we've got and then later on we've even got a load of suggestions that have come in from the rank squad so it's going to be a really fun episode today um but before we get stuck in and we need to do things we love and look, the thing I absolutely love at the moment is the Premier League title race. Yes, the game at the weekend was boring. Um, Man City and Arsenal uh, bore people to tears with that um, match that they slugged out at the Etihad. But Arsenal will be happy with that. Mikel Arteta went there for the point and he got it. And the big winners from the day were Liverpool. But what's really interesting is that today, Tuesday, as I record this, there is a release of a new documentary on Netflix. It's a Manchester City documentary. It's called Together, Treble Winners. And I've just started to get stuck into the first episode today. And it's just quite interesting. I mean, people who support Man City seem to not be talking about the doc very well. They're like, mm, yeah, there's nothing really here that's like that groundbreaking or whatever. But we've got to remember this, ne- this doc has been made for Netflix. So it's a wider audience and it's a it's it's supposed to be far reaching. It's a marketing tool for Manchester City, right? So it can't like hone in on like very, very minor details that like your average Man City fan might like because people that are just watching football in different territories might not be particularly interested in that. But do you know what? I thought I've already learned in this first episode about what Man City will be thinking and doing 
right now. And even in the opening sequences of the doc, you see that. You see Pep Guardiola, the complete angst he feels when things aren't going his way. There's, there's moments, you know, Man City beaten by Southampton and Pep telling them it's not satisfactory. The way that he dishes out um, a rollick injury to his players and says it's unacceptable. You also see that somebody like Rodri is an absolute mentality monster. And I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about this, but mm. I bet right now he's the guy. I bet he's the guy that is like churning this over and over, week in, week out. We win this title again. We win this title again. Um, and from Haaland, which the first episode is basically the Haaland show, um, I'm wondering if he's suffering a bit of performance anxiety right now. It's funny because you see him talk a lot about he's the best performer. There's even a sequence where a few of the players are doing their initiation songs and Calvin Phillips is definitely the best singer. Ortega definitely isn't. And Harlan's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's good to see Calvin Phillips getting some love off something at the moment. Yeah, given the way totally. Things go for him. No, he does a decent job. Um, but Harland is just a performer. He can't sing very well. But he stands there and he's like, he's just confident. And afterwards he says, yeah, well, mine was the best. Um, mine was the best performance. And you just feel like he needs that. He thrives off of that. And I think there are just little snippets in that first episode. And they talk in it about how Man City are having to adapt to Erling Haaland and how they've played without a striker and how he sets the tone for how they press and all of these different things. He's so vital to Man City actually winning the league this year. And while that seems very obvious, I think when you watch this doc, it becomes even more obvious that like this guy is not going to be okay with his own performances right now or his own output. And I'm thinking, hmm, yeah, we might see a massive, massive bounce back from Erling Haaland in the games to come. Now, obviously, we have got a midweek run of games in the Premier League this week and uh, both Arsenal and Manchester City are playing on Wednesday, the day that this podcast is released and Liverpool then play on Thursday. So very interesting as to how these next games play out. But Man City have got a reasonably tricky game against Aston Villa compared to the other two. Arsenal play against Luton, Liverpool play Sheffield United. But yeah, get stuck into this City doc because even if it's not the best insight in the world that we'll see, um, it's still far better than anything else we usually get into a side that's won the treble and a side that in the main is the same team that are going for a fourth consecutive Premier League title this season. If they do achieve it, it's a monumental effort. It is history. And if they don't, I think this doc gives a clue as to how that dressing room will be feeling. They'll absolutely crumble, I think. They, they, they will not take defeat very well. Yeah, I mean, it would it would be a massive blow, right? Considering how it was the top of the world. I mean, obviously there are differing avenues. If they don't win the Premier League, but they go back to back in the Champions League, I don't think it's going to be disaster class and throw the walls around at Manchester City. But I, I think you're right in terms of they want to win everything. Once you've tasted that, right, it's it's hard to come away from it. And having achieved pretty much everything there was to achieve last year mm. will have left a mark that they want to, you know, a high water mark that they want to get back up to. I, mm. I, I think that's important. So, yeah, I, I agree. I haven't watched it yet, but you, you've sold it pretty well there. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward yeah, to, I mean, to getting stuck in. Look, there aren't great reviews out there at the moment for, from a lot of people, but a lot of those people are the people, I think, that, uh, closer to City that cover City week in week out or read about City closely week in week out and I think for a bit more of a neutral perspective somebody that just loves football you know the insight you get to Guardiola as I say the angst definitely and how frustrated he gets when things don't go his way but also the joy that this guy feels like there's one specific um, scenario where City are just training ahead of the Community Shield and they put together this sequence of passing and Pep is just overjoyed. And he's celebrating. He's like, that's it, guys. We've won the Premier League. We've won the Premier League. Unbelievable. I'm so happy right now. I'm so happy with you all. And it's like, ah, oh, this guy, like when he's on top of the world, you must feel like you are absolutely untouchable. And when he hits you with criticism, you must feel like, oh, my God, 
I have got to raise my game here because I want to impress this guy. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, four things we love. I'm actually going to stay in England for once. Uh, I do have something on the way that Saudi Arabia is unfolding, but I'm going to leave <laughs> it a couple of weeks because I think it, it's one we can we can kind of pinpoint on the map. Okay. Maybe maybe next week or the week after. So I just wanted to talk about the Easter weekend in the championship because wild. it was wild. But also it's one of those things where this weekend feels like a really special weekend every time in the championship because everybody plays on Good Friday and everybody plays on Easter Monday. It's just one of those weekends that I think growing up, it always felt like a very big weekend for football. And I think that's kind of gone a little bit in the Premier League, but it's still very much there in the championship. And this race for the Premier League is twisting and turning and it's Unbelievable. I watched a lot of championship football this I watched a lot of football full stop actually this weekend when I was in Lancaster. And it was great. I had a great time. But just seeing the twists and turns develop, you know, obviously wasn't a perfect weekend for almost anybody apart from Ipswich Town, who now lead the championship with six games remaining. Caveat. Leicester are two points behind them with a game in hand. And Leeds are one point ahead of Leicester. One point behind Ipswich, having played 40 games as well. So Leicester have seven games. Leeds and Ipswich have six. Southampton actually have, they have more. They have eight games. So, but it was it was a dreadful weekend for Southampton. So they were leading Middlesbrough until the 90th minute when they conceded a, a late equaliser to Latte Laf, who is one of the best names in football, I think. Um, and then they lost yesterday in dramatic fashion to Ipswich Town. So Southampton, one point from six over the Easter weekend, and they are now 11 points behind Leicester, 12 behind Leeds, 13 behind Ipswich. Yes, they have two games in hand on the front, two and one on Leicester, but feels too much. Feels too much. I think yeah. there is no longer a four-way race for promotion going no. on in the championship. It is down to three. And Leicester had a dreadful time of it against Bristol City. They created... Chance after chance after chance after chance. Jamie Vardy should have had a hat trick. It was quite brutal watching it in some ways. But they did concede and they lost that game 1-0. They bounced back. They were the first game on Easter Monday. That is a lot of pressure. You've relinquished your lead at the top. They were outside the top two for the first time in a long, long time. Bear in mind Leicester had a 12-point lead at the top of the table at one point. They were outside the top two, outside the automatic promotion spots. And then they had to play first on the Monday and they went behind the Norwich. They're in good form themselves. They're coming off the back of three wins into this game. Josh Sargent's been absolutely on fire for, for all our USMNT listeners, keeping an eye on, uh, on big Josh. He, he's, been, he's been excellent. Uh, only second player in championship history, I believe, to score in eight home games on the trot, which is a pretty cool statistic. Um, but yeah, they, they went first. They went behind to Norwich and they bounced back. They won 3-1. There's a, a good header from Kieran and Dewsbury Hall, an excellent goal from Steffi Mavadidi to put them ahead. And the collective sigh of relief, I think, that went round at the King Power when Jamie Vardy scored a late sort of sealer was palpable. It was like, okay, cool. They went back to yeah. the top of the division temporarily. All the three o'clock games happened. There were some mad things going on in the three o'clock games. Shouts out to a, a couple of teams down the bottom as well. QPR pulled themselves well away from... Their brilliant weekend for QPR. Jimmy Dunn scored an absolutely outrageous goal did, um, on, yeah. on Friday to win it. Uh, right-footed centre-back, playing at right-back, scoring a dipping left-footed volley from the edge of the box. Just mm. ridiculous scenes. They won two in a row. I think they're safe. Um, Birmingham got a big win yesterday. Jay Stansfield scored. That was, that was a big one. Um, Stoke have, have now got four points from their last two games. They've pulled themselves out of it a bit as well. So the bottom's still incredibly tight, but we've seen some big results, I think, in, in, in those kind of periods. Then sort of comes next and you go, right, who's on next? Ipswich plays Southampton. And you're thinking, oh, last chance saloon a bit here for Saints. They go behind really early on and then almost immediately turn it round. And the second goal for Southampton in particular, um, an Armstrong duo. Uh, it was a Stewart assisting a brilliant pass. The weight on it, absolutely glorious um, mm -hmm. way. Suddenly Southampton winning and then Ipswich. Portman Road is absolutely roaring them on. Nathan Broadhead comes off the bench, scores an equaliser, and it is one-way traffic in the final minutes. So the, the entire crowd on to score this win and score this win. And pretty much the last kick of the game, Jeremy Sarmiento on loan from Brighton 
sort of stumbles in the box and, and forces the ball past Bruno, sends it to the top again. The place goes bananas, absolutely potty. It's unbelievable, the scenes that you see. They go back to the top of the division, and then, okay, all right, pressure on Leeds. Leicester and Ipswich have both won. Leeds are playing Hull. Sort of now, two losses. I mean, they haven't won in five holes, so they're probably out of out of the race for for the playoffs now. But still, a decent unit, I think, under, under Liam Senior. And it goes to this point, Leeds take the lead, they get pegged back, good goal, Fabio Carvalho, of all people, on loan from Liverpool. Um, nice, nice touch. And again, it is one-way traffic. And in the 88th minute, Crescencio Somerville wins a penalty. Takes the ball of Joel Perrault, who's taken pretty much all the penalties for Leeds mm-hmm. when on the pitch, regular penalty taker, and has the balls to go straight down the middle with it. The place erupts, unbelievable, great scenes. And then Dan James, who's had a tough time, but we've talked about you know him and his penalty miss at Wales, scores from the halfway line. And you can see the catharsis in his celebration. It's palpable. You know how much he needed that goal, as much as how much Ellen Road needed that goal. Leeds mm-hmm. jumped back above Leicester. There are two points between the top three. Leicester have that game in hand. And we're in for, I think, one of the most remarkable run-ins of all time. It, it was unbelievable. Late winners or late sealers, all three of them. And you can just, it's almost like the exhales around the ground. And having been in that, you know, we've been there at the cottage when Fulham have been in tight promotion races. Those last minute winners, those feelings of absolute jubilation, I think are up there with anything I've experienced in the game. Yeah, it's amazing when you're chasing it down like that. Um... That Ipswich ending was just amazing against Southampton. Um, the way he looked like he'd missed the chance and then pokes it in, you know, that stadium goes absolutely crazy. A friend of mine is a Southampton fan. He said, that's it. Like, it's total that's deflation. It. Like, can't recover from this. Like, And also, and then, you go into the playoffs, right? And yeah, one, it's a tough one of feeling. these three is going to be in the playoffs because only two go up automatically. And the other thing is that Southampton feel like, you know, after that ridiculous run of games, was it 22 unbeaten that they went, that it's all just sort of gone <sighs> flat again. Suddenly they're conceding yeah. late goals again. The clean sheets have gone. Trying to re-up yourselves again for the playoffs. I know it's, it's a lottery. We all know that. It's a mad, madhouse, the playoffs. But be it, kind of consigning yourself to that at this point, it's like, okay, can we build ourselves back up now ahead of that? That's a tough ask. It's a tough ask. Can you just mentally. remind everyone what this means, Jack? We Which talked about it on Patreon, but the well, bag. The bag is, is in real trouble. The, the bag, bag is in trouble. Leicester City, I mean, although, to be fair, if Leicester win their game in hand, then Leicester are back top of the division. But it is, it's unbelievably tight. I mean, I'm, I'm stressed about the bag. If Leicester got, break the bag, I'll be furious. Absolutely mad. They were the main 12 points of the Mate, like we've had the roulette wheel. We've had melon of the week. We've had the bag. We might have none of those. We're going to have to bring back the roulette wheel or melon of the week if we lose the bag because it's been such an integral part of this podcast. And we've said long and long, if one goes, there's no the point having a bag with a hole forever. in it. Yeah, 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 there's no point having a bag with a hole in it. And, and it there's might no take... rank squad. What do you want back for next season? <laughs> the, bag, the bag might come back in years to come, but it, were, it, it, it won't be, be, it won't be going year. next year if, no. if the bag breaks. We'll have to spend some time thinking about you know, how to buy a new bag. It's time season. for Melon of the Week. <laughs> this week's Melon of the Week could be Jack Collins. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that'd be some way to lose it, wouldn't it? Some way to lose it. But yeah, the championship race, absolutely incredible. And everybody should be tuned in. It's going to be really tight. One last thing on it. Hmm. The amount of Ipswich fans that would have loved that win over Southampton even more because Southampton's manager is Russell Mayan, ex-Norwich City legend, is quite something. And... Yeah. There's an old farm this weekend, the East Anglian Derby, Ipswich, Norwich, at Norwich. How much would they love to derail yeah. the Ipswich promotion? Ah, oh, it's all just everywhere. I'm so excited. Yeah, I've been to that derby before, actually, and it, it is a very, very good one. So, um, yeah, make sure you're watching that one because Norwich are doing well at the moment. Josh Sargent is on fire. Indeed he is. Indeed he is. Um, right, we will leave part one there. After the break, we're going to be talking about some rule changes. Don't go anywhere. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. 
Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home. Welcome back to Ranks FC. It's me you can hear, which means this is a Dean Jones ranking. I'm very, very excited about it. We're going to be talking about some rule changes. Dean Jones, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, it's not really my ranking, mate. We're going, we'll do the actual ranking together at the end. But actually, more pressure is probably on you than it is me in this episode, I'm afraid. So you maybe didn't realise that. Um, this is not what I, I signed up for. <laughs> I mean, ranking rule changes we want to see is how I kind of sold it to you yesterday when uh, we were coming up with ideas for, for today's pod, because that's how forward our planning is for these shows, right? It's within 24 hours of the show Some, actually sometimes, going out. Sometimes we have a plan, <laughs> other times it is what we feel in this week. Yeah, it's part of the magic of Ranks FC, man. Absolutely. But um, I had had this one up my sleeve a, li- a little while and uh, I just hadn't drawn up the list properly. Um, so it's up to you what you actually call this episode. You could have a think about it after we've been through it. But yeah, I've got seven rules here. And at the end, we'll draw up a top five at the end. Two of them won't make it. Um, but these are things that some have been mooted before. Some haven't really. Um, a couple of them are silly, but most of them, I think, have got grounds for actually being in existence in this beautiful game we call football or soccer. Um, right. The first rule, Jack, that I propose that I think should be considered within the game is the player that gets fouled takes the penalty. Yeah, it's the NBA rule, isn't it? The free throw. The player fouled mm. takes the two shots from the line. So, yeah, I mean, I can, I can get up. I think in some ways it makes sense. In other ways, you know, it, I think it takes away a little bit from the specialism of being a penalty taker. Does it increase the lottery of the game? 100%. But if it then becomes a, oh, okay, where, where, where does that stop? Does the player who gets fouled have to take free kicks? Does it, mm. does it how, where does where does it all come from because i think it maybe reduces specialists in these areas and i never want to see a reduction we've lost a lot of you know i think specialist free kick takers anyway we don't see as many free kicks struck at goal and you know rightly so in many ways because they are worse chance creators than, than perhaps putting the ball in the box in more dangerous areas but there is something incredibly beautiful and special about a free kick being pinged into the top corner and I think there is also something very special about players who are exceptional at penalties. Now, you can d- agree or disagree with that. Some people are like, no, penalties shouldn't t- be taken in the spot. Some people think they should be from wherever they're fouled in the box. Some people think all sorts of different things about, about penalties. I don't mind it as a concept, but I don't think it changes. I don't know if it removes the need. I mean, obviously, we're going to see a couple of rules here. I- I- I'm-, I'm relatively ambivalent about this. Really, yeah. I mean, I just think it it just adds something to the game. And I I just wonder, like, if the game was being invented now, is this the obvious thing that would happen? You know, I think that there's a possibility that if you were just coming up with the rules, you're like, right, this guy got fouled, so it's a penalty. Most people would be like, okay, so he's taking it because he's the one who had the opportunity. He's the one that was taken down. So he gets the chance for justice. That's what I see this as, justice. That person was fouled. He has to take this opportunity. It's It's between redemption possibilities. Yeah, it's between him and the other team. It's got nothing to do with the rest of the team. This is down to this guy. Basically, Raheem Sterling has gone down here. And it's Raheem Sterling. Sorry, Chelsea fans. Bad news for Chelsea. (laughs) (laughs) going to have to take the penalty. Um, Anyway, that one has obviously been mooted many times before. I, I I think it's it's an interesting one because and and the reason I'm slightly as I say I'm pretty down the middle on this. The only thing ticking me towards the idea of it is a completely rogue and very very unlikely scenario in that the keeper's up for a corner and he heads it against someone's hand and you get a last minute goalkeeper having to take a penalty against the other goalkeeper. The scenes will be through the roof. That, that that's honestly that very small zero point no 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 one percent chance that might happen is enough to push me in the direction of I quite like it. Yeah, there was once a study uh, in Germany, it was way back in 2002, but somebody studied five seasons um, of football in Germany in the top flight. And apparently they found that the player that had been fouled and took the penalty scored 12% more often 
than somebody who took the spot kick that wasn't fouled. So maybe there is something in this justice argument that I'm throwing forward. So there you go, something a bit different to think I, about. I'm a big fan of justice, to be fair. There you go. Um, right, the next one. At the moment, offside is really annoying. Because if your finger or your shoulder or whatever is just a millimetre beyond that of the defender, you're offside. Basically, any part of your body now is offside, you are offside. Let's flip that. I say, if any part of your body is onside, it's onside. We get more goals, we go back to the attacker having advantage. This is what we had years back. Like It was always supposed to be that the advantage was with the attacking player. And if there was any, any doubt, the goal stood. We've gone completely the other way now. And it's like, oh, no, we don't want goals in this game. Cancel it. Cancel it. Everyone's like, no, 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 no. No, hang on. Look at that. Think, yeah, his tooth's off. Offside. No, no, you're not having it. Forget about it. No, let's not do that. If you've got a foot that is onside, let it be onside. Let's give the defenders more to worry about than the attackers. Yeah, I mean, I, I fundamentally, I agree with you. In real time, there's been more goals in this Premier League season than ever before. We're talking about a, a significant uptick. In Imagine a doubling form. it. <laughs> <laughs> Every game is 6-5. Um, you know, the problem I have with this rule change is that I don't think it fundamentally changes any of the arguments. I think that, you know, in, in process, it's quite a nice idea. But actually, you're still going to have these arguments about whether his toe was actually onside in a, in, a, in a scenario. If someone's hanging their leg back as it quite reached the defender it doesn't change any of the arguments that you actually end up having with VAR, right? Because it all it is, all it is, is you're just shifting the balance of the argument. It's just, uh, instead of, is any part of him offside, it's, is any part of him or her onside? And I think that that does start to, we're not actually addressing the issues with VAR that I think are, are, are there and the problems that people have with it. Now, I mean, I should put it out there that I think that VAR is improving. And I think that we are getting better at it, you know, already. I think it will continue to improve. And there is lots of question marks. And I completely understand the argument of anyone who's like, it's ruining the game for various reasons. And I'm not disagreeing in itself with that. I think that we're getting to a place where things are quicker. The semi-automated offsides are important. It's going to speed up. And that's the process, I think, that frustrates people most. But... I don't think this rule change shifts the balance in terms of offside. I just think we're just talking about a then a different, we're just talking about the flip side of the exact same coin. Okay. I'd like to see more front footed play. I want to see people taking a gamble like they used to in the old days. People don't gamble like they used to off a defender's shoulder anymore. You and I were both, we both played very similar roles when we played football, right? We were both nippy Sub. strikers. Yeah, well, mostly so. Yeah. <laughs> nippy strikers off the bench who tried to get in behind the defender. And thus, this rule appeals to me as a, you know, in, in the, what I would like to have, have happened when I was playing football. But, I mean, I imagine that as a centre back, being like, are you taking a piss? I've got enough to worry about with you, how are you changing the rules in this regard? So I, I appreciate where you're coming from. Um, but I think that there's plenty of defenders listening to this who tell you that this rule, you can shove this rule, I'd imagine. The third idea is scrap offside. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All together, no. The third uh, concept I put to you, Jack Collins, is that taking your shirt off should never be a yellow card anymore. I think that this is outdated. I'm not entirely sure why it began. Probably because of the messages that were being sent. No, out. I, be I, I, can tell, I can tell you why it began. Go on. Um, because it's about sponsorship. It's about the fact that people oh, who yeah. paid for shirt sponsors weren't happy with players taking off the shirt. And then in the big celebration pictures, the headline pictures, the ones on the front of newspapers, they didn't have the advertising that they basically paid for. What and, nonsense. And in that rule, I mean, I'm not a businessman. <laughs> in that rule, I completely agree with you. Straight to the top of the list. This is nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. I don't like it at all. Like it even less now that you've reminded me of that. Um, I, yeah, I, I just think that this should, like players take their shirt off heat at the moment. Um, we've seen players like, you know, the situation that, that Man United had recently, like score this incredible late goal. 
you know, against Liverpool, and then it ends with a red card. Yeah, and now Ahmad Diallo can't play in the semi-final that he got. He got Manchester United yeah. into. I mean, utterly ridiculous. It's, it's utterly mad. Look, you can say, yeah, but he shouldn't have taken his shirt off. Like, no. why? No. Why? Like, I, none of us know how it feels to score in that. And I, At Old is, Trafford against your eternal rivals in a season where United have had very little to celebrate because they've been relatively bad oh, throughout. A hundred. They've revved up. They're like these. Like, and he's. He's been waiting for this opportunity for yeah. a month. I mean, that's I, I his reaction is to take off his shirt. That's what he wants to do. Who cares? Just do it. Don't worry about the sponsors. They, got, they just had 90 minutes of the game being broadcast across the entire world. People know who sponsors these teams. Jump in. Also, you know, jumping into the crowd should go with this as well. If, as long as it's the home crowd. If you jump into the away crowd to rile them up, then yeah, okay, fair yeah. enough. But if you jump into the home crowd to celebrate, very simple. Like, I think yeah. we've seen a reduction in that. I don't think we see as many yellow cards for that kind of celebration quite anymore. But yeah, all of these counts don't take the emotion out of the game. Exactly. Um, this one's a little bit different. My fourth idea for rules we should consider changing. Obviously, we are seeing a lot of added time these days, more than ever. Sometimes you're getting 10, 15 minutes added time pretty ridiculous because once we're getting towards the end of the game you don't actually know how long is going to be left so it's time to change this stop the clock rather than adding injury time let's have somebody in charge of the scoreboard of the official times that go out on tv broadcasts and when the referee decides that this is this uh delay is getting too much he puts up his hand you stop the clock until the referee says restart the clock Everybody will be clear. We'll be back to having 90-minute games, and we will know when a last-minute winner is a last-minute winner. Is everyone fit enough for this? <laughs> You're basically adding 30 minutes of game time to any given game. And I wonder, my, I don't mind this as an idea, but the problem becomes when do you stop the clock and when do you not? Do you stop it every time it goes out for throwing, for a goal kick, for a corner? No, no, or no. Or is no. it just when... Because then it's for delays. People, running it's for down, delays to the game. people are running down the clock whilst you know delaying a goal kick or, or taking ages to come over for a corner. What point does that become a stop clock? This is a good idea, but I think it's hard to put into practice. Obviously, I watch quite a lot of rugby as well. And obviously, the stop clock is something in rugby that, that is, is quite prevalent and works, I think, very well within the confines of the game. But I think it's a very different and less fluid game than football is in many regards. And the stoppages, I think, in rugby tend to be more clear cut as to what is, you know, what is a time off and what is time on. Mm. Whereas with football, I think people can take a little bit longer to go over, you know, because someone can amble over to the corner flag to take a corner, mm. respot the ball a couple of times. Yeah, but you can just get booked. Just get just booking for that. Like that, that's a, they have to bring booking, in time waste. Take that's time waste for uh, the yellow. Yeah, let's, start, off, let's start sending uh, people off. And say, oh, get, the, get the old blue card out. Uh, <laughs> I like conceptually. I agree. In practice, I think this one's quite hard to implement because I think that there people will. I mean, it's just going to start different arguments about when the clock should be stopped and when it shouldn't. Is is basically my point. yeah. But I think you can quickly figure that out. I think that, that that's very easy to quickly draw up a plan for when that happens. Um, I think it's actually easier to introduce than VAR's ever been in to introduce, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's almost a natural progression of the game. Look, a lot of sport does become Americanized at some point. And I think that while I don't want that to completely happen to our game, this is a concept that I think is worth looking into. And I, I think don't also eventually... necessarily, I don't think this is necessarily Americanization either. Like rugby's had it for years. This is very much not an American game. Rugby, do they? Well, but, I mean, the point being that you're not, you're not, you're not just being like, cool, we've nicked this from the NFL. It's not, you know, yeah, that yeah. It, it's one or the other. I think that this is something that is part of various games around the world. I wouldn't suggest there are plenty of things that you can look at and be like, this is an Americanization of football. And not all of that, by the way, that sounds negative. I think quite a lot yeah. of that is positive stuff. But actually, I think when you're looking at this in particular, I, would, I wouldn't call that an Americanization. Okay. This is a wild one, the next one. If you draw nil nil, both teams get zero points. <laughs> I 
No one wants to see Neil Neils. No one deserves to see Neil Neils. Even good Neil Neils aren't okay. I think from the weekend, <laughs> that game, both those teams should have ended that match with zero points. Arteta's thought he's come up with a great plan. Not in my future, mate. You're getting zero points for producing a, a display like that. Um, yeah. What do you reckon? I, I mean... <laughs> I mean <laughs> this is thank, American. Thankfully, you said it was wild. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was given at least a minute to think <laughs> about it. Um, this, is, this is a dumb idea. And oh. it penalises... It penalises lesser teams. And I've always... <laughs> I'm always wary of this, right? And as someone who supports, obviously both of us, but as someone who supports a, a club that is you know, trying to punch upwards rather than downwards. And then people used to get really annoyed, especially when Fulham were in the championship, at teams that would come in and, and sit low and waste time you know, to try and get a point. I'm like, well, obviously. And when you go into the Premier League and you're playing against you know, a city or maybe not this Fulham, but various you know, iterations down the years, it is about occasionally earning and grinding the points out that keep you safe and and playing with the dark arts in order to to try and rectify or try and deal with the anomalies between levels of talent that exist within the game i comp- i understand where you're coming from because i think obviously it would it would completely and utterly revolutionize the game in terms of what you're trying to do every time you go on the pitch but i think it punishes teams lower down and that isn't something I think I can get on board with. But, I mean, I do appreciate the, the, the conceptualisation of it. Mate, I'm pretty sure Fulham have only had two nil-nil draws this season. Nil-nil at home to Everton. Nil-nil which, was nil the best at nil-nil, Palace. Nil-nil, which was the best nil-nil anyone's ever seen. There was about 52 chances. It should have ended 5 all. Yeah, but didn't deserve anything from it. She didn't deserve anything from that game. And the Crystal Palace game, honestly, we should have been deducted points for being involved in that one. <laughs> um, that, was a, that was an atrocious match. Um, so I'm, I'm leaving that one on the board. Let us know what you think. Um, the next one, again, is a, li- it's a bit out there because this doesn't really get touted. But I think, if I, again, if I was introducing football today, we were inventing this game, I think this rule would be the other way around. If a goalkeeper handles outside the box, it's a penalty. It's not a free kick. It's a penalty. Oh, yeah, I like that. That is, I've never heard anyone move that. That's a great idea. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, 100%. The problem is with your, rule, with your rule changes, who takes it? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing. So you can have a, de- for handballs, you can have a designated taker. So you can still have that expert penalty taker that gets to step up for handballs. Um, but if someone is fouled, then they have to take it. So in that this rule, instance, that, that's that's a very good rule. Like isn't that it? should be implemented tomorrow. Thank some you. of these are difficult. Some of these are hard. That's a crack, that's a cracking rule change. Brilliant. I'm glad you're on board with that one because I thought that was really good too. And because I don't think that a goalkeeper, can, yeah, he might get sent some off. Some of your ideas yeah. have been dreadful, but that is class. Yeah, that's the whole idea of this. Um, okay, good. I got one more for you, Jack. Before seven, we seven, a ranking of seven. This is well. Rare. This is the thing. Two of them aren't going to quite make it, and I think I know which ones. But <laughs> here's the next one, right? After a goal is scored, right, we go to kick off, and the team that just conceded a goal kicks off. Why? Why? Why do they get the ball? The team that has just scored the goal should keep possession of the ball. They should get they their reward for scoring that goal is that. They still have the ball. No. Yes. No. No. Why? Bad rule. Because it because it it puts you in an un- like a position where you can basically wind down clocks and see off games. I don't like it. That the idea that it goes back to the other team to basically have a go the other way, I think is a good thing. It's a basically like if you score a try in rugby, you kick off and you kick it back to the other team. I think it's the same in the NFL as well. So when you concede, you get an opportunity to immediately go to the other end. And I think there's something in that, right? There's something in the kind of like, right, you get an opportunity. You know, we talked about justice earlier. You get an opportunity to rectify the situation. You get an opportunity to go straight up the other end and try, <laughs> try and get things level. I think this is important. And I think it is important for parity. Because if City score against a lesser side and they get the ball back, the other teams aren't going to see it for another 20 minutes. Like, they should at least get the chance to lump it into the opposition box and, and get a big no, man. No, no. I, I think definitely. This is, again, you, you've, you've fluctuated between genius and madness here, and I quite like it because obviously there's, there's different elements <laughs> of this. I, 
No, I can't get on board with that, I'm afraid. You have to you have to give a chance you have to give an opportunity to punch back. Yeah. If you're playing slaps with someone else, right? <laughs> Came in the playground where you put your hands <laughs> out and you get slapped, you get to slap them back. Hmm. Same thing. Just putting it out there, mate, if you're ranking. <laughs> it's not my ranking. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. We're going to rank it now. So from those seven ideas, I have just written out a quick list, one to seven. And from what I can gather from your reactions, well, your like, no, 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 was that this nil, nil draw gets you zero points. So is that going at seven and not making the top five? Uh, along with this kickoff one about yeah. the, op- I think, I think the those kick- two aren't even making your top five. They're not making the five. No, you should keep the ball after you score. I think might be seven. And then if you draw nil, nil, both teams get zero points because at least I can appreciate the, the conceptual, what you're trying to get out there. Okay. I, I disagree with it, but I, I can see where you're coming from. The keeping the ball after you score is an absolute no, no. So that's okay. seven. I know if what the top two nil, are going to be. Yeah, I've got my top two aside. So the, the, the next one will either be, um, if any part of the body is onside, it is onside. Um, the player that gets fouled takes the penalty. And the final one is stop the clock rather than adding injury time. Which one of those five are you going to put as number five? I'm going to put at five the any part of your body can be onside and it should count. Because... Okay. I don't think it fundamentally changes the problems we have with the offside rule. I think that there is a something to be said about the idea of giving the attack of the advantage again. Mm-hmm. And maybe the line is slightly different and maybe we have to use thicker lines or something in order to actually push that towards the, the attacker in a sense. But I think that this just flips the problem. Then we end okay. up with the same problem just in a slightly different sense. So I'm going to take some defender's sides here and put that in at five. Okay, so then at four, are we stopping the clock rather than adding injury time? Uh, Or is it that the player that gets fouled takes the penalty? I think it's the player that gets fouled takes the penalty because I think it takes away the specialism of penalties. So whilst I I think if you were going to completely rejig the penalty scenario and you have to take it from where you're fouled or all these different elements of, of where it is, then that's an interesting concept to go into as a whole. And at that point, I think maybe that is there. But right now, I think that this is, this is tricky. And it br- takes us to number three, which is stop the clock instead of injury time, which I think is a really good idea. I just struggle with the implementation of it. And okay. I worry that the fluidity of football would mean that actually people would end up just as frustrated, if not even more frustrated, than they are with 14, 15 minutes of injury time at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so we're left with two options to see which wins this ranking. The two options we've got are, if a goalkeeper handles outside the box, it's a penalty. Or, taking a shirt off should never be a yellow card. It's the, the keeper one is number one. That's, that, that rule, again, should be implemented tomorrow. <laughs> that is, it's just one of the most sensible suggestions I've ever heard. It's like, yeah, absolutely. He comes out of the box and handles it. That's a pen. Yeah. It's just correct. It's like, how is that not the rule? I don't know. I actually, <laughs> think about it like this. I'm unsure how it's not already been implemented. That's, that's a phenomenal rule. I know change. every other penalty decision comes from a, that box, right? But this is the one instance that doesn't make sense because the goalie's allowed to touch it with his hands in that box. So if he uses his hands outside of that box, it's a penalty. I don't even really want him sent off. I just want a penalty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no red cards, just pen. Straight up. Pens all day long. And it brings it back to double jeopardy. Great stuff. That's a perfect rule. That, should be, that, that goes in at number one. And number two, taking your shirt off should never be a yellow card. Um, I don't understand the business of football enough to, to, to see what that would do in terms of sponsorships and, and actually whether it would decrease revenues and all of these things that I don't really get. So I'm just going to put that in it too in that I think it should be implemented, but someone smarter than me about, about these kind of things would probably have to, to look into what it would mean in terms of the financials. Maybe throw that one to Kieran Maguire. Price of football, and then see, I'll see what he him thinks. Later. Yeah, and see what he thinks about the, um, <laughs> the, you know, the financial impact that that could have. But those two in particular, I mean, I think should just be rules that we should implement. Cool. Well, there we go, mate. That was fun, wasn't it? 
That was fun. I enjoyed that very much. The fun's not over. The fun is not over. After the break, I have posted on Patreon for the Rank Squad to come forward with rule changes they would like to see. And I'm going to right now quickly go through the app and see what the best ones are. And we're going to come back with that straight after this break. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome back to Ranks FC, and we've got the best of the Rank Squad over on Patreon giving us their thoughts. Obviously, over on the Patreon, we release two extra episodes minimum every week, a post box which looks back at all the action across the weekend, a Friday fiesta which looks forward to the weekend and deals with any of the midweek action as well. So if you fancy joining us, there are free trials available for the Patreon right now. The link's in the description as ever. We'd love to to have you as part of our wonderful little football community. Do yeah. have the rank squad delivered? <laughs> they have, mate. And, you know, like one of my favourite things about the Patreon is that uh, we literally get to know the listeners. Like, I could reel you off, like, a couple of hundred names probably of people that actually listen to the pod because they are commenting, like, regularly. And I notice when people aren't there, and I've actually, like, in the last few months, like, I've sent a couple of people messages being like, are you all right? I haven't noticed you on the Patreon. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm okay. Sorry, I just had some life stuff. I'll be back. I was like, okay, just checking you're right. Anyway, what's funny is that the top comment is from one of our regulars, Jonah, right? You know, one of the Ceresny brothers. They are big Madrid fans, right? They are big Madrid fans. Every single week, they're writing in the post box. They're telling us everything we need to know about Madrid. They've got some hot takes. Jonah, <laughs> I'm not going to address many of what we've actually just covered. But the top thing in the Patreon, as I read it right now, is Jonah, who says, I think whoever wins the penalty should take the penalty. (laughs) This is what I haven't thought about specialist penalty things. They have not considered Jorginho in this. And I'm always trying to consider Jorginho, you know. (laughs) He says, this will make penalties more reflective of who should have the goal. Spread goals around and add a little bit more suspense to the penalties. I hadn't really thought about that. It would really affect... The golden boot prize as well, wouldn't it? You know, all these yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, these guys that like get their numbers up by taking eight spot kicks a season. Alex Isak gets two uh, penalties at the weekend. Did he win both of those penalties? No, he won neither of those penalties. In fact, no. one of them one of them probably wasn't a penalty. But you know, that's, <laughs> a, that's a question for a different day. So Alex Isak doesn't want this rule, but um, me and Jonah absolutely do. Um, now, what I've just noticed too is that. There's a guy called Connor who has just dropped in and he says, I'm a long time listener and I really don't comment very often, but I've got a few suggestions for you to mull over. When I say a few options, this guy's like written a book about all the different rules that we should have. Um, So I'm going to quickly address a few of them because I think a lot of them are great. Um, So he says, increase corner uh, spots. So the, the, the corner, you know, that little like triangle, semicircle, th- quarter triangle thing we have, uh, whatever it is, what do you even call that? The corner spot. I don't know. That little thing we get over in the corner anyway. Um, he said, make that bigger because it will increase the variability in delivery for greater increase in goals. I like that. Wow, I've not thought of that. There's much more reason how to big? win a corner not how too much bigger think? but just to like take a different angle on it you can't really do much at the moment can you not really <laughs> no i suppose not i mean you might even be able to have more shots just, i mean straight basically, from corner. It, it basically is this is what short corners are for right and routines to try and in- change the angles of stuff i mean it probably decreases the amount of short corners that are taken good the other thing connor says i love short corners I do too. Treat the woodwork like a defender. He doesn't mean like do step overs to try and get past the post. What he means <laughs> is that if a shot hits the crossbar or the post and goes behind the goal, it's a corner, not a goal kick. <laughs> <laughs> he said it keeps pressure on the defending team and rewards the attackers for actually having a shot. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I like that too. I like, I like that, that too. a lot. Um, Connor's honestly got like a thousand ideas here. I'm only going to say Connor's on a roll here. Yeah. He is, um, and uh, his other one is make smaller tournaments more interesting by not doing eleven v eleven. It's like 
So let's say the Olympics or the Carabao Cup. Why not just do it as a seven aside? Clubs or nations pick the best of their squads with unlimited subs. It would be fun. And then you also get all the fastest players each league every year and have a 100 metre sprint for league points. And it counts for the podium finishes. <laughs> <laughs> you turn football into Formula One. I think that last one might be a bit... Um, a MLS bit used to do bit. that. Uh, yeah, no, was- not MLS, actually. It was a, No, it was actually in England at Wembley. There used to be a race. It was either, I think it was like the first year or two of the Premier League. We've talked about this before, though. Do you remember back in the BR days, we discussed the idea of what like a football combine would look like because it was it was NFL Combine Week, and we were obviously discussing the different bits. We discussed what a football combine would look like, and we came to the conclusion: how angry would clubs be if your star player pulled up? halfway through a 100 meter sprint did an ACL and was out for the next season it's just it's just not feasible but I mean yeah. conceptually the idea of playing sevens on an 11 aside pitch I talk about rugby a lot today but yeah rugby sevens rugby, is, rugby sevens is so fun because it is literally just that really fast players playing on a big pitch it is actually much more watchable I'll give you that so um, like as in the idea of football seven aside football on an 11 aside pitch I mean, as a you, you'd, again, I think people would have big question marks over injuries, etc., and the amount of ground yeah. you'd have to cover. But my God, it would be fun. I mean, there was always an argument for like shaking up the Carabao Cup because it was the it was the pot that nobody cared about winning until like about three or four years ago. And but suddenly, it matters now. So yeah, uh, so it's, it's, it's out the one. window. Um, right, Ryan has written in. He said, "My idea revolves around the summer transfer window. Teams are banned." from sharing any information on transfers, including players and management over the entire course of the window. So no one will know until the players walk out on the pitch for the first game of the season what has gone on over the last three months. Ryan's (laughs) trying to put you out of a job, mate. That's what Ryan's trying to do. He said, imagine Ronaldo suddenly just walking out at Old Trafford when he returns to Man United. It would be amazing. He said, the problem is Dean might go out of business, but it'll be worth it. Oh, cheers, mate. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, cheers. Hasn't considered, Ryan has not considered your two boys when he's been thinking about this. So I'll tell you that. Uh-huh. But, um, I mean, don't I'd get have me to wrong. rebrand. You'd have to rebrand, but it, it would be fun. The idea of just not knowing who was coming out. I mean, you'd have to then ban programs. You'd have to ban newspapers, to... news outlets, journalists, everything. Um but yeah, that would be funny. It would, it would be very funny. But it'd be very funny. Um, maybe teams just didn't announce it. That, that, that could work. Like There could be all the speculation, but the teams don't actually announce their signings until like 5th of August. And then suddenly you get the roster for the new season. Yeah, a big reveal. Like, oh, we did actually sign these guys. Or you may be like, oh, they pranked us. Dean Jones was just being like... The wrong direction of all this information. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the conceptually great in practice. I'm afraid we could probably have to rule that one out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, William says penalties should only be worth 0.5 goals. <laughs> I've heard this suggested before. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it would work, but yeah, I mean, it's a bit like those FIFA modes, isn't it? Well, like you had those games where if you scored from outside the box, it was worth two. Yes. Basically, yes. Uh, it's a variation on that. Yeah, exactly that. Um, right. I'm, I'm having to scroll through these without actually reading all of them. Uh, sorry if I do skip over yours. Some of them are just a little bit um, complicated. I do appreciate all of these that have come in. Um, there's a lot in here about VAR, a lot. Um, we should probably about, leave the VAR ones alone. Um, it's not fun to discuss VAR at the moment, is it? No, you know, there's, you know, for example, Doug. He says VAR should be capped at two minutes. The West Ham Villa game was the first time I've genuinely felt I'd be better off watching on Sky than in the stadium. So there's things like that which definitely um, I, I can see the arguments around it. Here you go, Jack. Here's an absolute belter. It's coming from Megan, who is. A loyal, loyal uh, rank squad Shout fan. Out yeah, she really is an ultra. Um, listen to this. Referees have to take their shirts off and celebrate every time they get a controversial call correct. <laughs> 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 Running up to the away fans, giving it large, like as they've ruled out a last minute goal. Yeah, oh. exactly that. Um, I don't think we want nice to increase one. any of the abuse being given to referees, but I mean, wow, that is quite... No, mate, I'd love it if a referee 
makes a call and it goes to VAR and he's made the right choice and he runs aw- runs to the other fans, puts his shirt over his head, punches the air, Does runs he, back, blows the whistle. Also get increased the linesman where they're getting the offside calls right and things. Yeah, hundred percent. Everyone should be getting involved. Um, what the official yeah. guessing what the guessing what the scoreboard's going to read before the referee tells him absolutely going ballistic on the sidelines <laughs> definitely right the last one for this segment um comes in from Akshanch who says let's start actually booking players for diving he said it absolutely does my head in when the ref does the get up motion as if he's just too scared to actually make a decision also Let's make it mandatory for referees to be foreign born. It makes it a lot harder for ingrown bias to be part of the game. Imagine that. Or you just like, so you have the referee academy in wherever it is in England and then immediately you send them all to Italy. And all the Italian referees go to Spain and all the Spanish referees go to France. Mate, something like that. You don't know, you'll do your refereeing course. You don't know where in the world you're going to be refing. Do you think it would actually increase innate bias? Because if you have someone who, I don't know, is in France, let's say, and they've grown, they go to, they get sent to Spain. Do you reckon that innate bias would automatically be towards Real Madrid and Barcelona because just the stature of those two clubs within the game as, com- you know, comparable to maybe some of the smaller clubs in La Liga? Do you think it would actually not change anything at all? I wonder. Hmm. I mean, Go the other way. Yeah. <laughs> you would. That's a simple <laughs> <laughs> I'd go the other way with it. Um, but yeah, I do like that shout. It's you a very different off, one. Me getting kicked off the referees course when they find my like Betis membership card. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, brilliant. There's, there's still some coming in right now. So um, if you're sending me in on Patreon right now, we'll give, if you haven't made this episode, I'll give a few extra as a shout out on uh, Friday's episode, um, anything that I think was worth addressing because there's some brilliant stuff there. And I think it sums up this episode perfectly. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I, I enjoyed that. Great stuff. <laughs> it's been a fun hour, isn't it? It's been a great hour. I've had a great time. I hope that all the listeners have had a good time as well. As you say, a little bit less serious than maybe some of the episodes we've done in recent weeks, but I've had a good laugh. I've had enjoyed myself. I hope that everybody listening has as well. And we're going to leave it there. We did an hour and a half almost last week on Wingers. Mm-hmm. So we're going to keep you a little shorter this week, give you a, a little bit of a, a smoother transition. I'm sure there's plenty still waiting to listen to that Wingers episode. Had a look at the time, went an hour 24. No, thank you. Can't be dealing with that right now. So go and listen to last week's episode. A lot of time, a lot of time ranking Wingers, actually. Um, also, I wanted to put an apology out. I got a message on Twitter or X, if, if you prefer, from... Matt Lepowski, and he said, why was Jared Bowen not in the discussion? And I replied to him saying, I did mention Jared Bowen. And he was like, I just listened back. No, you didn't. I was like, oh God, I'm so sorry. I messaged Matt with the list I'd put together, the actual yeah. notes on it that had Jared Bowen in it. And turns out I just completely and utterly- Did talk about him? Just, oh, I, I must yeah. have just skipped past him as we were doing the honorable mentions. So oh. apologies, one to Jared Bowen, two to Matt, uh, three yeah. and three twenty other West Ham fans of this thing who were, you know, absolutely apoplectic yeah. at the fact that he didn't get an honourable. It's mention. funny you mentioned that because Jeremy Doku uh, sent me a text the other day and he said, I'm... <laughs> Jeremy, "Jeremy Doku is not not near that ranking. There's no honourable mentions for Jeremy Doku this year. Much as I love him, he's uh, he's got a way to go. But Jared Bowen felt unfairly missed off, so I thought I'd just mention that." Um, shout out to Matt for bringing it to my attention as well because that was completely unintentional. He was in the notes and. Just managed to absolutely accidentally uh, skip over Jared. So my apologies, Jared, and West Ham fans listening. He was supposed to be in those honourable mentions. Uh, And with that, I think we'll probably call this a day. So all that's left for me to do is say thank you very much to Mr. Dean Jones for all those brilliant ideas. (laughs) Cheers, mate. That was a good one. Thank you very much to the Rank Squad for providing brilliant content as ever. You can get involved. Link in the description to join the Ultras. It's a lot of fun over there and a brilliant brilliant community of like-minded football fans we'd love for you to get involved i've been jack collins this has been ranks fc thank you so much for listening as ever and we'll see you very shortly rank squad take it easy peace final seconds of the game a chance to score and the chance has gone begging if your business's commerce platform keeps missing the target on golden opportunities 
Get the MVP you deserve. Get Shopify. <laughs> Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool that you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling signed football boots from Shopify's in-person POS system or you're vending vintage shirts on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn them from browsers to buyers. What I love about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is truly a global force, powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash ranks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com forward slash ranks to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash ranks. 